Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you've taken advantage of our little sweetie bar over there. Cookies and I think the grapes are all gone, but <laughs> we have cookies, coffee, and tea uh, to keep us perky this late afternoon. Um, welcome to all of you on behalf of the Awalid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. Welcome to our discussion today, Approaching Jesus in the Quran, Christian and Muslim Perspectives. Thank you all for being here, and also thanks to our co-sponsors, the Berkeley Center and the Department of Theology here at Georgetown. The position of Jesus in the Quran is among the most interesting in the discussions in the world today, especially in the context of rising Islamophobia. It's pretty frightening to find out that while attacks on Muslims are spiking, as they have over the past two years, and especially in this year, um, the majority of Americans uh, express openly when asked that they know almost nothing about Islam. Yet they're afraid of Muslims. So it's very interesting. Most um, of these people would be extremely interested to find out that Muslims actually believe in Jesus, that they consider him a great prophet, and that the Quran even refers to him as the Messiah. Among people who do know about Islam's view of Jesus, there can be great concern um, that the Quran presents Jesus in a very different way from the way Jesus is described in Christian theology. Many Christian scholars think that the verses in the Quran you know, that deal with Jesus are inconsistent with their beliefs and therefore prove that the Quran cannot be the word of God. And many Muslims think that Christian adoration of Jesus is idolatrous. Today, we're very honored to welcome two scholars who are working on a joint research project on this issue, sponsored by the prestigious German Research Association. Um, and our guest scholars today believe that their work will help Muslims and Christians appreciate each other's positions. Dr. Klaus von Stosch is professor of theology, uh, of Catholic systematic theology and chairman of the Center of Comparative Theology and Cultural Studies at the University of Paderborn in Germany. He's author of several books on systematic and comparative theology and Muslim Christian dialogue. He's one of the most important scholars of comparative theology in Germany today. His most recent book, The Challenge of Islam, Christian Approaches, published in 2016. Dr. Mohanad Khurshid studied Islamic theology and sociology in Beirut and Vienna. Since 2010, he's been professor of Islamic religious education and since 2011, head of the Center for Islamic Theology in Munster and coordinator of the Graduate School of Islamic Theology in Stiftung Mercator and head of the project on Quran and in the context of mercy. His recent publications include a book titled God Believes in Human Beings, published in 2015, another called Sharia, The Misunderstood God, published in 2013, and Islam is Compassion, 2012. Dr. Khurshid uh, will speak first, yes, followed by Dr. Von Stosch, and then we will have a question and answer discussion um, in which we'll welcome your comments and questions. So please, if you will join me in welcoming Dr. Mohaned Khurshi. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a big um, honor and big pleasure for me uh, to be here. Thank you for, for this uh, invitation. And excuse, please, my bad English. I will present um, a short reflection on Jesus in the Quran by reference to Surah number 19, Surah Maryam, and Surah number 3, Surah um, Al Imran. The Quran itself provides multiple uh, occasions to speak about Jesus because his life and acts are given extensive space in the Quran. Anyhow, we find much more details about Jesus in the Quran than about Muhammad himself. Also, 
the Quran gives cause for questions about a Quranic Christology because the Quranic statements, especially about Jesus, challenge Islamic theology severely. Jesus is the Word of God. He is the Spirit of God. He has been supported by the Holy Spirit. He is an ayah, a divine sign, just like a Quranic verse itself. He is a mercy for the world. This and many other descriptions of Jesus, which I intend to discuss uh, exemplarily on Surah 19 and, uh, and Surah 3, leave many open questions. The Quran remains silent about many Christological issues. For example, the Quran mentions in Surah 4 that the Jewish didn't crucify Jesus, but doesn't elaborate the question of his crucifixion. Even if Islamic theology refuses his crucifixion, save for a few exceptions, this position cannot be deduced from the Quran. The Quran doesn't directly represent Jesus himself as a revelation by God, but gives hints which also allow Muslims to describe Jesus not only as, as a message bearer, but rather he himself is the message because he, he is God's word, spirit, and a sign, an ayah of God all at once. Now some words to Surah 19. Surah 19 belongs to the middle Meccan surahs which were revealed between 615 and 618. This period is also known as the period of Rahma, period of mercy, because God's name, Ar-Rahman, is prominently represented in this period. Especially in Surah 19, the name is mentioned 12 times, like in no other surah. It must be noted that in this period, Christianity is positively received. Now, Jesus in Surah Maryam. Surah 19 is named after the mother of Jesus, Maryam, Mary. Here, the first detailed mention of Jesus takes place in Quran. The Surah begins with, uh, with the birth story of John which I don't intend to go into right now for time reasons. The Surah further refers to the birth of Jesus, the son of Mary. At the beginning, the angel announces the birth of Jesus without it having been requested previously by Mary. The encounter with God's spirit in human shape is making her seek for shelter in the merciful. At this point, the name of God, Rahman, is used for the first time. God himself is merciful and thus can be called the merciful. Also the child that has been announced to Mary shall not only be a sign, but is called himself mercy. Already before the birth of Jesus, the subject of mercy in the context of the birth stories is therefore, therefore, Conti um, uh, continuously um, enhanced a development which mirrors itself also in the biblical report as Klaus von Stosch, my colleague Klaus von Stosch, confirms. Firstly, Jesus is introduced by God as a sign for the humans, which he gives to the humans to bestow mercy on them. Already this first Quranic reference on Jesus appears a peculiarity of his mission. He is not only the bearer of signs, but he is also sign of God himself as a person. Therefore, Jesus is also called the, the word of God, but also the spirit of God. The Quran uses the word ayah, sign, to describe Jesus, which is the same word for Quranic verses. And so Jesus appears in the Quran as a functional equivalent um, for the verses of the Quran. Both are signs of God. The portrayal in the Quran starts with the 
annunciation of Jesus' birth and continues with its description. Here also Mary's contractions and the agony which they cause her are extensively depicted. The Quran underlines here with the human nature of Mary. Because of the illegitimate conception, Mary is reproached and she is compared to a harlot. So Mary helps herself by referring to Jesus, who should defend her. So Quran 19.29 As a newborn, Jesus talks and introduces himself as the servant of God who is entirely surrounded by God's salvation. Jesus speak, speaks here not only to his mother, but to all humans. The reason for his um, intervention is God's mercy uh, repetitively uh, uh, the um, advocacy for his mother. Unlike the verses beforehand, there can be not doubt in this passage that Jesus talks. My colleague Klaus von Stosch sees in the act of speaking of the baby a metaphor in the spirit of many Sufi exegetes who see therein an eschatological picture for the speaking of a pure creature on the day of judgment. But what was the content of the baby's speech? He begins with calling himself the servant of God, Abd, 1930. We don't find such a self-description in the Quran for any other human. Yet it's com common um, that God calls them his servants, any many, uh, and many humans are each named his servant. But that somebody says of himself that he is God's servant is a unique event. As Klaus von Soch says, here a Christological um, severine uh, title is therefore incorporated and has been contextualized in a new way, probably with a quite critical intention. In this connection, the Quran rejects all forms of a uh, uh, redeeming power of ritual uh, sacrifices. After the self-description of as God's servant, the introduction continues with Jesus' statement that God gave him the kitab. Traditionally, the word kitab is understood as a scripture or a book. Therefore, Muslims believe that Jesus, like many other prophets, received a book of his own and the Bible which we pose today is only a subsequent uh, uh, torture. However, the word kitab that is uh, found in the Quran doesn't always describe a book, but also a dogma. Prophet Muhammad too was told that the kitab was revealed to him, although it's known that the Quran was compiled, uh, compiled as a book after the prophet's uh, death. Therefore, Jesus received a doctrine which he proclaimed. And I would say in the tradition of Liegenhausen that Jesus himself is the doctrine, this message. Afterwards, Jesus mentions that his whole life as well as his death is sustained by the divine blessing. Especially this perspective um, encompassing the entire life of Jesus intensifies uh, the impression that the life of Jesus and his teachings altogether are important and not just a certain period of his life or a particular message. Surah 19, the verses 34 till 40 and later verses 88 until 94 continues with an insertion 
which denies any sonship uh, of Jesus. This refusal is probably not directed at Christians because Christians would never identify Jesus as Walad in the sense of a biological son of God. Moreover, Arabic Christians consider him as the Ibn of God. Also, Quran 1988 is not directed at Christians, but rather at pagan Arabs who allude that God has a wallet, which is criticized in other passages by the Quran. Klaus von Stosch concludes from a Christian point of view, the Middle Meccan period contains many positive, but also to Christian ears, very concerning statements about Jesus, even if plenty key titles and attributions on Jesus are missing. Jesus is introduced as a sign of God which clarifies his mercy. In addition, Jesus appears as God's servant and an exemplary person, as someone who is familiar with God's will and who lives out of him and is in this way a prophet, so that, all, um, that also his teachings could include the scripture given to him. Jesus appears with evidence and calls up for obedi uh, uh, ob obedience, but some ordinates uh, himself to God and struggles against any divinization of his person. All that, one could find a Christian source about Jesus and it would also provide many interesting um, indications for a modern reconstruction of Christological uh, thoughts. At the same time, the views on concern of the Quran to reflect on Jesus' nature because of his recognizable future is, is striking. For time reasons, I will elaborate on Surah 3 with only few words. Surah 3, Surah Al-Imran, it's likely that Surah Al-Imran in its essence originates from early Median time, so in uh, emergent after 622. It's remarkable that the uh, prologue in the uh, second surah of the Quran, which discusses extensively the figure Jesus of Nazareth, describes the relationship between God and human with words of love. It's ademically the human at this point who should love God in advance. But if one reads this verse um, in connection with later narratives, which also deal with Jesus' statements from uh, Quran 5:54, one can find evidence inside the Quran that God approached the, uh, us at first with his love. Immediately, the first interview, uh, introduction of Jesus in Quran 3:45 is remarkable. The angels enunciate Jesus as a word of God, and for the first time, his name uh, cries and also the title Messiah um, is used. While Islamic sciences interpret the application of the name Christ as a mere adoption of the, um, uh, of the more common name Jesus, and in this sense question um, every deeper theological meaning, classical Muslim exegesis um, had frequently tried to uncover the deeper theological sense of the title Messiah, Al-Masih, which is used as a name for Jesus, according to Ibn Abbas, means that Jesus um, anointed the sick for healing with his hand. According to uh, Tabari, God called Jesus Al-Masih because he uh, uh, porif, uh, uh, porif, uh, fed from uh, sins and was also himself uh, purified from sins and 
uncleanness. According to Arazi, it's a name for Jesus because he had never touched a uh, uh, sufferer without healing him. He touched um, wizards as well as uh, sinners, and because he stroked the heads of orphans in the place of God. Moreover, he was anointed with pure and blessed oil, and he was touched by Gabriel's wing during his birth, and in this way was protected from the touch of the devil. Klaus von Stosch concludes, those exegetical uh, efforts clarify that the incl uh, inclusion of the title uh, Messiah is by no means self-evident and allows a number of possible theological interpretations. Those can also encourage Christians no newly discover this name commonly used as the title for Christ. In particular, the thought that the touch from Christ and uh, being touched by him is of, of, a major, uh, of major, uh, uh, significance seems to be highly uh, interesting for us. The Quran itself doesn't undertake any interpretation, but embeds the first appearance of the title Messiah in a way that positive associations with him are immediately uh, of voice, of views. The following report of Jesus deals with the fact that he will be close to God in this world and in the afterlife. So it seems that Jesus is affiliated to God in an excellent manner, who is close to God from the beginning of his life, and because of that, he proclaims his word as a baby, and even death cannot bring him final destruction. It seems reasonable to deduce from this special intimacy and closeness to God the reason for calling him God's word. It's likewise clear that Jesus' life was special from the moment of his conception to his resurrection and his um, ascension to heaven. Klaus von, so uh, von Stosch concludes further, as a consequence, the tenor in Surat Al-Umran seems to be one in total which still doesn't uh, pursue an, uh, any polemic uh, purposes and takes over different titles uh, of Christ in a prominent way. The surah is carried by the wish to form a monotheistic common sense which highlights the devotion to one God, but allows at the same time to reach out to him in different ways and in this context, uh, context um, practices um, ambiguity tolerance on the uh, basis of a common uh, monotheistic belief. Critical tendencies towards Christianity are ob uh, obviously referring to a, a certain uh, group, Quran th uh, 369, and are not uh, generalized. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here and to be able to continue the talk of Mohanad Rashid. As you will see, we are working closely together. He is a Muslim, I'm as a Catholic. And we try to make sense together of the verses on Jesus in the Quran. Uh, but we try to do it in a, a peculiar method, which I would like to explain you first. So one thing what we try to do is to give a diachronic reading of those verses of Jesus and the Quran. So we begin at the very moment when the revelation begins, which is for the verses on Jesus, the middle Meccan period. That's why Muhammad Rahid just started with uh, the Surah Maryam, because it's the first one, chronologically speaking, 
uh, when Jesus is uh, discussed in the Quran. Uh, then the next step is uh, sure in um, Surah 43, but we won't go through all surahs, but only take the three ones where, uh, which tell the most things on Jesus just because of uh, we are re uh, restricted on time. So we are only looking at Surah Maryam, Surah Al-Imran, and Surah Al-Ma'idah, and my task for today will be to discuss Surah Al-Ma'idah. But first of all, to understand the method. So one part of our method is to go diachronically through those verses. Most v books, by the way, we both try to write a book on Jesus and the Quran together. Uh, so in the end, that's why I'm here in Georgetown to learn from Sidney Griffith especially, and to discuss with him her, especially the historical questions. But in the end, hopefully next year or in two years, we will have that book together. And what we do is, first of all, this diachronical method. Second point, a surah holistic approach. So we are not taking just one verse, uh, but we always look, what is the meaning of the verse in the context of the surah? Just take uh, verse 157 in uh, Surah 4, which most people think is against the crucifixion of Jesus. If you just look at the context, it's very clear that God is speaking to Jews and not to Christians. And uh, it's kind of weird that God explains to Jews that the basic belief of Christians is simply nonsense. So if you just look at the context, you already see, okay, maybe the original message of the surah is something else that's uh, what people thought later. Uh, so that's uh, something we learned from Angelika Neuwert in the Corpus Quranicum project in Berlin that we always look uh, holistically at the surah. So we always make a plan of the whole surah and look, why is this verse exactly there? And second thing, always go diachronically. So we're using the uh, chronologically, we start with Theodor Nerdeke, but we look how it developed, how Angelika Neukwert makes sense of it, how Muslim approaches make sense of the chronology. And then we end up in some uh, yeah, theology of the Quran on, on Jesus. S uh, another thing which is peculiar for our method is that we are doing that together. So not only uh, Monat Khashid as a Sunni Muslim and me as a Catholic, but we try to include other Muslims like Shi'i Muslims. We try to include other Christians, especially are oriental Christians, uh, especially from Syriac Orthodox background, because they have a lot of things to, to teach us uh, for this uh, subject, but also Jews um, who have a background, especially of the Talmud, of rabbinic teaching, so uh, that we have many voices in our exegetical work. And then uh, we do not stop there, but we try to find third parties who like look at this from another perspective, like uh, Sidney Griffith again. Uh, so we go to scholars who deal with the same stuff, but who are not coming from a faith perspective like us, but bringing us other thoughts and ideas. And this changes a lot, as I experienced in those days and those weeks in discussing with, uh, with Sidney. Uh, so this is the way how we are working. And um, our aims, it's very obvious, they are uh, not the similar aims. So we're using sim the same method because we think they are theologians, and we think all theologians have the same method, just hermeneutical methods. Doesn't matter whether you're Muslim or uh, Catholic or person or whatever. But uh, you have different aims. I would uh, like to explain Christianity. I want to defend Catholic belief, and Muhannad Khajit obviously wants to defend a Muslim belief. So, but within that endeavor, I as a Christian, uh, try to take the Islamic appreciation of Jesus of uh, Nazareth as seriously as possible. So I try to go, see unto which step I can go with Muhammad, with Muslims, how much can I learn from them. So I try to show how I can learn as a Christian without abandoning my aim, the claims of truth. How can I learn from Muslims how the Quran can also be a kind of word directed to Christians, that the basic idea of uh, my attempt. So I want to investigate whether I can accept as a Catholic the Quranic approach to Jesus and uh, whether this can even deepen my own Christology. So that's the basic idea. And now I try to show it a little bit how I'm doing this in Surah Al-Ma'idah. I take this surah 
because it's the most complicated for me because there's the most polemic in it. You saw in Surah Mayam, it's, the Puran is very uh, nice to Christians. He's maybe even not really talking to Christians, as we would argue, but we can discuss this later. We have the impression that that's really the time how Fred Donner would put it, that's the believers movement and the Christians are really part of the party we belong together and the polemic with Valat, as Mohanad Rashid said already, that's a polemic against uh, the Quraysh, not against Christians. But this changes in Medina. The Quran is very, uh, gets in a very uh, direct contact with Christians. In the beginning, Ali Imran, as Mohanad Rashid explained, it's still very friendly, very inviting them and we, we just read uh, um, Al Imran together, the whole surah, and Muhammad Rashid asked me at the end, and are you happy as a, as a Catholic now? Is this, um, is this surah making you happy? And, okay, yes. After his explanation, after he helped me to understand certain verses, I was happy with everything in surah uh, Al Imran. But then comes surah Al Maidah, and there are some passages where it's very difficult to be happy as a Christian. So let's discuss that surah. First of all, what is very interesting, if you look at this holistically, and I have not seen any book who's mentioning this, so it's really a little secret I'm uh, telling you. But what is so interesting is that you have a framework. In the beginning, the first 11 verses are the kind of uh, uh, speech of uh, where good uh, speech of Muhammad to his people, where he gives a kind of institution of the rituals which are needed in Muslim community to uh, keep the identity, like ritual prayer, how to wash, and all this stuff. So it's beginning with something which explains how to be a Muslim, how to stay a Muslim even after the death of Muhammad. Muhammad is talking of his death. That's also why we know that Surah al maidah is very late, which is very important for those guys who think that the latest thing is the right one. So um, if you believe in that, you have to take Surah al maidah very seriously. So in the beginning, we have what is said from Muhammad to his people. And then in the end, we have what is Jesus says to his people. And um, I will take you, tell you a bit more in looking at the text, because it's also 11 verses, only a kind of last speech to his people. And really parallelly, on both sides of the surah, in the beginning you have Muhammad, in the end you have Jesus. So this shows already that Muhammad wants to be understood in the tradition of Jesus. But let's look at this, uh, just at the surah, the structure of the surah. So you have this framework. And then you have a long passage really addressed to Jews and Christians, where the Quran again and again, time and again, says, you Christians. So there are a lot of things to told to Christians, and not all of them are so easy to understand. We are looking at some of those verses. And then in the other part, we have some jurisprudential rules for Muslims, so they fit to the first part of the, of the surah and the other one uh, fits somehow to the last part. We have so both subjects, how to keep identity as a Christian, as a Muslim in this surah. So what is so interesting um, is that we, in the, through uh, the whole surah, the surah gives a lot of appreciation to Jesus, even in this very critical one. And is uh, saying here, I give you some quotations here, like Jesus fulfilling and confirming the Torah, so bringing the gospel with guidance and light. But what I find most interesting and astonishing is that the Quran is also confirming many miracles, including reviving the dead. So you really think, after you read this in verse 110, okay, there's so much said on Jesus, how can this be taught? Can, can be there more than reviving the dead? And come, then comes this verse which says that the disciples are waiting for a table coming from heaven. And usually this is understood as another miracle, just uh, let God, uh, Jesus wants to give many bread to 5,000, you probably know. But how this, this cannot be uh, more than uh, rising that dead. So if it wants to be something more, it has to be something more decisive. And if you look very closely at those verses, it's very obvious what is meant. Because first of all, the, the disciples are saying uh, that they wish to eat from this table so that our hearts may be reassured. They need something. When Jesus has gone, that their hearts are reassured. They need something which makes them strong in their faith, even without Jesus. 
And so then Jesus is asking the father uh, to give him this sign. And uh, if you look here in my translation, it says, O oh God, our Lord, send down for us a table from heaven to be a, 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 a feast, a celebration, not a festival as it is often translated for us, for the first of us and the last of us, very ritual speech. It's a sheer that there is a ritual behind that. Um, and a sign from you. And provide for us, you are the best of providers. So we discussed this first really a lot. It, first of all, it was just my idea that this is an allusion to the Holy Eucharist. And some of my Muslim colleagues in my group really did said that it's completely nonsense, now you're really violating the Quran, impossible. We discussed it so much, but today we all agree, really, that's, that's so amazing. The Quran is really appreciating that sign that Christians, for Christians, they've given something to stabilize their identity, and they even will be punished if they don't go to church on Sunday. So uh, that's very interesting. That's, uh, so we have a lot of appreciation for Christians also in Surah Al-Ma'idah. We also have a remaining legacy of Christianity um, after, and also of Judaism after Islam. One of those verses, certainly you know it's uh, 48, is so often quoted by Muslims, but it's important that it's in that context of that surah and this very last surah of the Quran. Probably the fifth surah is the last surah of the Quran. Maybe it's also surah 9, there's a debate on that. But we think that Surah 5, the Surah Al-Ma'idah, is the last one, and we can explain why if we have time later. So what is said there is that uh, God has a path for each of his people, for Jews, for Christians, for Muslims, that fits very well with the framework, that there is this path for Christians who have to go to church on Sunday, and for Muslims who have to have their ritual prayer. So there are special ways for both kind of people. So in the begin, the Quran, like Fred Donna says, this believers movement, you want to take everything together. But no, it's not the believers movement anymore. Now we have different religions, but they are respected as different ways. And it's, I, I like very much that idea uh, when the Quran says, had God willed, he could have made you a single nation if he had willed, God the Almighty. So it's very obvious, it's, the plan of salvation of God, that there are those different paths, which is a very interesting lesson for Christians to learn how to make sense of it. So we have a lot of appreciation in that surah, and that's why it's so important to look why there are also those polemical questions, polemical um, speech against Christians in that surah, and this is really directed to Christians. That's not like pagan Arabs, as we would say, for Surah Maya. So what uh, is the critique of the Quran against Christians in that Surah? So first of all, the Quran is criticizing people who are reducing God to an idol. It's a fight against idolatry. So the Quran is uh, using this very weird uh, expression that the Quran says, God is the Messiah the son of Mary. Sidney Griffith and me discussed a lot on that because he said to me, never a Christian says that. There's no Christian in history who ever said that. You, as a Christian, you say it the other way around. You would say, if you say, I wouldn't say um, the Messiah is God. That's maybe not the way how I would express it because it's the son of God or the word of God, not God. But if you like to say it, like many evangelical Christians like to say, then it's, it's not the other way around. Uh, but um, if you have a closer look at the Christological debates of the 6th and 7th century, you, you will, uh, and I cannot go into detail now, but maybe later if you are interested in it, you will find in the context of the debate of the uh, Theopesiate, the Theopesiatal debate, you will find uh, Christians who are arguing like that, who are arguing like that they say, uh, because they were... Uh, um, they were um, uh, questioned, they were asked by the other uh, party. Uh, they, they used such a weird language that they said, okay, yes, God is also the Messiah, you can say this. Uh, so God is um, the third of three. 
this uh, Talatatin, which is, as uh, Sidney Griffiths showed, a title of Jesus in that time, in the very same debates. So what the Quran is doing here becomes very obvious from the context. You just have to look always after what the, the Quran is saying, don't say God is the Messiah in 1772 and 73. And then he's explaining, the Quran is explaining why. He's explaining God has power over him and could annihilate them. The Messiah is also worshipping God. There's only one deity, Jesus and Mary are no gods. So a lot of arguments which make clear what the Quran wants to say here. If you look at those arguments as a Christian today, probably you would agree. At least I would agree. I also say, yes, it's clear that God has power about Jesus. He can annihilate them. Yeah? If you deny that, you do not believe in the human nature of Jesus, which is essential for Christianity. It's clear that Jesus was worshipping God. I never understood why some Christ uh, Muslims try to make apologetic sense of it. It's even reported in the gospel many times. That's clear. And it's clear that Jesus and Mary are no gods. So you think, why is the Quran saying this? He is talking to whom? Like uh, Christians are not arguing like that. And then the weirdest verse for me is Jesus and Mary both e used to eat food. Well, okay. That's even essential for Christians. That's why they do the Holy Eucharist. would be weird if Jesus hadn't eaten food. So where does this come from? That's uh, struggled me a long time. And what is very interesting is that there was, in the 6th century and even 7th century, there was a huge debate within Christianity on the question whether Christ was eating and how he was eating. I wasn't aware of this before going into those historical circumstances. Because there was the idea, if Jesus is without sin, which is clear for all Christians, he is also without original sin. And if he is without original sin, He's also without the consequences of original sin, which is the punishment that he will die, that will he be able to suffer, and uh, that he has to eat. So the idea was, and that's not a very um, weird idea of some theologians, it's a very widespread idea, is that Jesus was not only without sin, but also with a human nature, which is like the human nature of Adam before the fall without sin, without necessity of suffering, necessity of death, necessity of eating and drinking. So what the Julianists want to say is we call those people who have that idea as Julianists. What Julian of Hanukkah and others, what those Julianists want to say is not that they say Jesus did not suffer. It was clear for them that he suffered on the cross. They do not want to say he didn't eat. It's clear he, he, he ate. But he did this because of his free will. He wanted to suffer. He wanted to eat. So it's like Jesus is, um, if he is really divine, and divine God cannot be, uh, cannot suffer. That was the context. If God cannot suffer, it's very clear that Jesus cannot suffer only if he wants to suffer. God is almighty. If he wants to suffer, he can't suffer. But he cannot be made, he cannot be forced to suffer. So what was very important for the Julianists is that God always stays sovereign. And Jesus, after not eating for 40 days in the desert, he decides to eat because, and to, he decides to, have, to be hungry. But no need, he could even continue another 40 days and not being hungry because his human nature is the nature before the fall. It's very interesting that the Quran is not saying Jesus and Mary were eating, but were used to eat. So it's exactly against that Julianist idea. And this is not only the, the idea of Julianists, it's also the idea of mainstream neo chalcedonian theology. Because they discovered, like Leontius from Byzance, Leontius from Constantinople, he discovered that as a great idea to get away from the struggle between Miaphysite Christian and Diophysite Christians, from Chalcedonians and anti chalcedonians He discovered that as a solution. Because if the human nature of Jesus is in, in its very nature, a nature which cannot suffer, it's much easier to get it together with the divine nature. So, even the emperor, Emperor Justinian, 
in his very late last days of his uh, rule, of ruling uh, the empire, decided to uh, to make an edict that everybody has to believe that. In the beginning, I couldn't believe, but now it makes sense. It makes theological sense. It's not a silly idea, but it's very dangerous for Christian belief because in the end, Jesus did not suffer because he had no alternative to suffer, but only because he wanted to suffer. And we all, if we really suffer, if we die, we don't have an alternative. The Christian idea of redemption is that God shares our needs. He shares this problem, I have to die, I have to suffer. If God only shares it in the sense, okay, um, I, 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 I suffer with you because I'm nice, I'm God, I'm good, I will suffer with you. That's not the Christian idea of salvation. So we would argue that the Quran intervenes at that moment to save the basic Christian idea and make another, another, um, another offer. Like for the Quran, it's clear you don't need Jesus at that point. The Quran is enough. You have the communion with God through the Quran. But you can also have it with Jesus. That's fine. That's good that Christians have that. Let's just look, Christian, there are more options. But if you want to do it with Jesus, okay, but don't tell that he's not a real human. That's a problem. That you get, then you're committing idolatry. That's very much the idea of what we see in uh, Almeida, and which leads to a critique, a very sophisticated and good critique, of the arrogance of Christians and Jews who think we are the children of God, we have understood it, we have made it. The Quran tries to show no. Um, uh, I, I don't have time to explain that now in detail, but just let me say in one sentence, this is the only passage in the Quran in Surah 9, uh, verse 30, where explicitly the idea of sonship of uh, Jesus is really criticized in the Quran. All the other passages are on Valat, not on Ibn. That's the only passage on Ibn, so which is taking up the Christian formulation. And what is so interesting is that here the context makes very clear what is meant. It's the arrogance of Jews and Christians. Not only, it's not the question that there's only Jesus, there's also Ezra as the son of God. If you read it together with 518, it's we who think we are the children of God. If you look at 931, it's the priests, the monks, the scribes who are taken as the lords. So the Quran is very much criticized, very much critical about that idea that you take something human and think it can be worshipped. It's a kind of idol. And me as a Christian, I would say that's very important uh, to, to see this also as a Christian, that there is this danger within Christ Christology and the doctrine of Trinity. Very important. I can learn a lot from the Quran at that point and learn a lot, I think, from each other in our discussion. And I'm now very excited and happy to learn from you and to discuss those ideas with you. Thank you for your attention.